Hello and welcome. Northern governors continue their peace mission to the southwest, visit scene of violence in Shasha, and join in a forum on the farmer herders crisis in Ogun. Speaker of the House of Representatives cautions against inflammatory comments by leaders as efforts to douse rising tension continue. The president challenges new appointed ambassadors to serve Nigeria with dedication and to focus on the nation's foreign policy direction. And Myanmar police slam country's deposed civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi with second criminal charge as she makes virtual court appearance. Plus we'll have sports, business and later on international news from our London studios. On business news tonight, Nigeria's headline inflation rate climbs further to 16.5% in January as food prices hit highest level in 12 years. And on sports news tonight, world number one Novak Djokovic makes it through to his 39th Grand Slam semi-final after a poor set victory against Alexander Zverev at the Australian Open. And from Abuja, President Buhari writes Senate Six confirmation of the Abdurashid Mena, I beg your pardon, Abdurashid Bauer, as substantive chairman of the EFCC. Peace at all costs. Well, that seems to be what northern governors and their southwest counterparts are saying, as efforts to douse the tension arising from the recent conflicts in Oyo and Ogun states continue. And in continuation of their tour, some northern governors visited Abeokuta, the Ogun state capital today, where they joined the forum to discuss the farmer herders crisis. Traditional and religious rulers from Ogun and Ondo states, representatives of farmers and herders, as well as heads of security operatives in Ogun states, were also part of the event. The Southwest Peace Tour, embarked upon by northern governors from Kano, Kebi, Niger, and Zamfara states, makes a stopover in Ogun State, where they are meeting with Governor Dakwa Biodun, who has his Ondo state counterpart, Rotimi Akiridolu, in attendance. The entourage proceeds to a venue filled to capacity, as all in attendance have the same objective to find a peaceful resolution to the lingering farmers' headers crisis. His opening remarks, Your Excellency, sir. Governor Biodun sets the ball rolling as he calls for collective action to tackle the problem. The question is, what could have turned issues that hitherto had easy and workable templates for resolution to suddenly becoming seemingly intractable? And more worrisome is that this is taking an ethnic coloration. There are some of the questions we must find answers to at this party. You must not only find solutions, you must also come up with more practical recommendations towards finding lasting solutions. In whatever form, color or ethnic group, a criminal is a criminal. Representatives of the farmers and herders bear their minds on how their sides have been affected and make suggestions they feel can help mitigate the problem. We have lost over three million cows to cattle restless and before one personality is kidnapped either in the city or on the roadside. 10, 20, 30, 50 of them must have been kidnapped in the forest on a daily basis. But because, but because it is not a reported story, it is unheard, people don't know it. We suffer, our members suffer more in the hand of criminals than any other citizen of this country. We need to profile and enumerate. Let us know who are actually here with us who have been here with us, so that we will know if there is a stranger. And if these strangers come, if it is possible for them to stay with us, then we identify if it's not possible, we do it peacefully. A review of the ECOWAS protocol is what the governor of Kano State, Abdullahi Ganduje, believes should be a starting point, as registration of herders will create a more accountable system of identification. We have to take some drastic measures, otherwise, we are just scratching the problem on the back. We must understand these issues. There are echoes problems. As of now, there are echoes problems. So through echoes, 
there must be a means of either registering the cattle that are coming into Nigeria or preventing the movement of cattle into Nigeria. That is a fact because they come with weapons. Initially, they were coming with weapons to protect themselves from the clash with the farmers. But now they have taken advantage coming with weapons that they sell into the country, a part of using the weapons to commit a crime. Governor Abubakar Bello berates the leaders from all quarters for letting the issue linger for so long, but is optimistic that it is not unsolvable. There could be severe consequences if action is not being taken now. And I believe now is the right time to be bold and strong and take very stringent measures without any sentiments towards addressing the problem. The issue of farmers and herdsmen has been there for long, but somehow it was being managed properly. But gradually the herdsmen migrated from genuine herdsmen to criminality and banditry. Beyond this conference of words, the real action many hope to see is the actual process of reconciliation between all parties that will bring the crisis to an end once and for all. Before visiting Ogun, the northern governors were in Ibadan yesterday to meet with the state governor over the recent crisis at Shasha Market between northern and Yoruba leaders. The governors who joined Governor Shei Makinde on a visit to the embattled Shasha community earlier today ended their consultations with the community leaders in the area where they appealed to both sides to embrace peace and to return to living harmoniously as they did before the crisis. Now, appealing to both sides to stop hostilities and forge a more formidable bond for peaceful coexistence, the governor of Kirby State, Atsiku Wabagudu, and the governor, Governor Makinde, pledged their support for every effort towards restoring mutual trust, respect, and lasting peace. Yes, it may be painful. When uh, the uh, fire started and I was contacted, I said they should send... Uh, a fire truck here. The fire truck was uh, vandalized, damaged. So I told the people that, well, yes, it's annoying that uh, we have to use uh, money that we could have used for something else to replace those fire trucks, to rebuild all of these uh, places. But those ones are very minor. When human life is lost, there's no way for us to replace it. We cannot make a, a life. And that is something that is irreversible. So my message is that of peace. Once emotions are get up, and social media is instigating, uh, unfortunately, we had the situation we had, which included loss of life, and we regretted, and we sympathize with all those who lost their lives and property. We saw the damage, and we appreciate what the governor has done so far, and community leaders, news groups, and security agencies. Others will now be in fear that there will be reprisal to know that the Nigerian Governors Forum, President Muhammadu Buhari, security agencies are working hard to ensure that we treat things for what they are. Incidences are bound to happen. Sometimes they are exploited by miscreants in society to loot, to, th to steal and to cause mayhem. And staying with the violence in Shasha and across the country, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Mila, is urging all those who have large followership and people who listen to them to respect their voices, to be more circumspect about the information they share, the language they use, and the conversations they engage in. According to him, words can have adverse consequences on the nation's peace and stability because words have the power to build and to destroy. 
Similarly, Honorable Dachong Bagos raised concerns about the governor of Bauchi State, Bala Mohammed, on his statement justifying why herdsmen should carry AK 47s. Once again, the issue of insecurity is a source of worry for lawmakers and the House of Representatives. What's even more worrying for them is that public officers who should be responsible for dousing the tension and maintaining the peace seem to be the ones fanning the flame. To address this, a motion of urgent public importance is raised, which is directed at state governors, specifically the governor of Bauchi State, Bala Mohammed, over his statement on the 13th of February, justifying why herdsmen should bear arms. Aware that the constitution does not grant any individual or group of people the right to bear sophisticated arms, but only a licensed sophisticated shooting range. Concerned further that if all public officials, regardless of their positions or status, are not cautioned against inciting or provoking the general public. Silence, please. Silence, please. The already tense situation in the country will lead to open hostilities. Meanwhile, the Speaker of the House is not oblivious of the influence which some Nigerians hold and how effective that influence can be for nation building and promoting security. I urge all of those who have large followership of people who listen to them and respect their voices to be more circumspect about the information they share, the language they use, and the conversations they enable. And to political leaders, let me reiterate that we have a greater responsibility to keep the peace in our country. And to do that, we must first commit ourselves to the cause of equal justice and fair treatment for all. Following the rising spate of insecurity in the country, lawmakers have in recent times shut down motions calling for legalization of arms bearing to allow Nigerians protect themselves for fear that it would only worsen the security situation in the country. Meanwhile, the House has now resolved to sit once weekly in consideration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Terry Ikumi, Channel Television News. Meanwhile, the Senate is working on a legislation which will impose stiffer punishment for illegal possession of firearms in Nigeria. A federal lawmaker that Senator Obasani is proposing an amendment of the Firearms Act intended to address the proliferation of illicit small arms and light weapons in Nigeria. Our correspondent Linda Akibe reports. The proliferation of small arms and light weapons in Nigeria is a security and humanitarian issue as it worsens conflicts and results in high death tolls directly from their use. This has serious implications for the country's development. During Tuesday's plenary session, a federal lawmaker is proposing the amendment of the Firearms Act, which he says is intended to provide for the destruction of firearms brought illegally into the country and also offers stiffer penalties for illegal possession of firearms. He argues that this amendment would help Nigeria address its unrelenting security challenges. Provide for stipulated time within which the destruction of the unserviceable farms must be carried out in several way there is a valid order of the, to the contrary, court order to the contrary. To provide an effective, coordinated and sustained legislative strategy to address the underlying factors encouraging the circulation of arms and concurrently block the outlets through which illicit farms are proliferated. It's a legislation which lawmakers support. As long as we have porous borders, I doubt whether, no matter how effective we have the legal framework, we we'll continue to have these issues. As long as some people feel threatened, some groups, because make no mistake about it, it's not just the criminal elements that are buying guns. You have some communities finding their ways of buying you know, guns for self-preservation. Why? Because they think that the Nigerian state is not protecting them. So I support the bill, but I think we should I, I, in, in assenting, I mean, in assenting to uh, the passage of this bill, I want to draw, my, draw our attention to the fact that there are larger issues that attend or surround uh, the issues of insecurity that we have been agitating. And once again, this is another opportunity to bring it to the fore. There is no compromise for stiffer penalties for anyone caught with an illegal arm. The security situation can still be reversed 
once we continue to remain focused and remain committed. As the legislature proposes different Later laws to address the spread of small arms and light weapons in the country, government can control the accumulation and prevent its abuse through effective regulation targeting the control of illegal and illegal sources of small arms and light weapons. Saturday, Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. In part two, after the break, Federal High Court turns down application seeking to restrain Muhammad Adamu from parading himself as the Inspector General of Police. Plus, seven children feared killed in a blast in Zamfara. A similar explosion leaves seven others injured in Kaduna. That's all coming up in a moment. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Northern governors continue their peace mission to the southwest, visit scene of violence in Shasha, and join in a forum on the farmer heard a crisis in Ogun. Speaker of the House of Representatives cautions against inflammatory comments by leaders as efforts to douse rising tension continue. The president challenges newly appointed ambassadors to serve Nigeria with dedication and to focus on the nation's foreign policy direction. And Myanmar police slammed the country's deposed civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi with second criminal charge as she makes a virtual court appearance. A federal high court in Abuja has turned down an ex parte application seeking to restrain Mr. Mohamed Adamu from parading himself as the Inspector General of Police pending the hearing and determination of the suit challenging the elongation of his tenure. Justice Ahmed Mohamed held that since parties have been served with the originating processes, it will be unfair to grant an interim injunction against the IG. In a suit filed by an Abuja-based lawyer against President Muhammadu Buhari, the Inspector General of Police, Muhammad Adamu, the Attorney General of the Federation, Abu Bakar Malami, and the Nigerian Police Council, the applicant argued that Mr. Adamu's tenure as the Inspector General of Police elapsed since February 1, 2021, by virtue of the Police Act. The IGP, who was represented by two senior advocates of Nigeria, Dr. Alex Izion, and Alex Ejesieme, however, announced a protest appearance as Justice Mohammed fixed February the 24th, 2021, for hearing of the case. Let's stay in the courts now. And a federal high court sitting in Lagos has upheld an interim order granted to the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria for the seizure of properties belonging to businessman Jimo Ibrahim for an alleged 69.4 billion naira debt. In a ruling which lasted nearly two hours, Justice Rilwan Aikawa upheld the argument of AMCON's lawyer, Kemi Quinero, that ANCOM made full and substantial disclosure of all material facts at the time of obtaining the orders on November the 4th, 2020. The judge ruled that the order subsists. The businessman, Mr. Ibrahim, who is also a legal practitioner, was in court, fully robed for the proceedings. Alongside Nikon Investment Limited and Global Fleet Oil and Gas Limited, Mr. Ibrahim had asked the court to set aside the order for non-disclosure and misrepresentation of material facts. And after failing to sit on Saturday, the Lagos State Judicial Panel on Restitution for Victims of SARS and other related matters commenced its sitting today without two of its members. Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Ebun Adewarua, who was absent, and had already given an indication last weekend that he was considering his continued participation at the panel. A youth representative on the panel, Renuala Odwala, has also tweeted her decision to stop further participation in the panel. 
With the absence of the two, seven other members of the panel sat to listen to 10 petitions listed for hearing. In the petition involving a man identified as Rashid Karim, who was reportedly shot dead by a policeman, two witnesses testified on behalf of the family, the brother of the victim, Olale Bankoli, whose testimony was closely followed by that of Imam Taufik, who described himself as the best friend of the victim. The panel watched a video tendered in evidence by the petitioners of how the late Rashid was allegedly shot, and this was followed by a cross-examination. I just heard the sound of something sound on IO. Before I could look up or look down, I see the whole world. Before I could look my side, I saw him on the floor. Before I'm up, please. Before I, before I came back to that place, I didn't know somebody has taken his phone. So people are doing this video before we not take him down to the city office. We are arranging now how we are going to carry him that very day because he's a Muslim. So you can't leave him like that. As an eyewitness, you told this family that you saw the bullet hit an eye before he hit the disease. No. Okay. The bullet entered his head. He was, can you see, sorry, can you see the pool that he was standing on? He rest on the pool. If you show the video, I rest on the pool. He was right in front of me. When the bullet entered his head, he came out and entered the iron, entered the pool. Meanwhile, rehabilitation work is ongoing at the Lecky toll gate days after the order for the Lecky concession company to repossess the facility and subsequent protests against the decision. Channels Television revisited the site and observed the presence of policemen. The van of the Lagos State Task Force is still on standby as the work gets underway. The firm regained possession of the toll gate following a February the 6th ruling of the Lagos State Judicial Panel of Inquiry for restitution of victims of police brutality and the Lagos Togate incident of October the 20th. Bandits have killed two people in Kachia and Igabi local government areas of Kaduna State. The killings come barely 24 hours after governors from the northwest region held a meeting with the newly appointed service chiefs on how to end the spate of insecurity in the zone. Confirming the incident, the Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arwan, says the bandits attacked Akwando village in Kachia local government area and killed one Diko Bagudu, a resident of the community. In a separate incident, armed bandits barricaded the road from Sabonbrinin to Rikau, an Igabi local government area, and killed one Ibrahim Abdul Mumin, a resident of Rikau village. Meanwhile, security agencies have reported the accidental detonation of a substance at the residence of Inigabi local government area. According to the report, children picked up the material from a nearby farm and began to play with it, not knowing what it was. In the process, it exploded, injuring seven of the children. In a similar incident, but this time in Zamfara State, seven other children were not so lucky as they feared dead following an explosion in Magami village in that local government area. The Commissioner for Security and Home Affairs in the state, Abuba Karo Dauran, told Channels Television that the blast occurred while the children were searching for firewood in the bush when they picked up an explosive device. He said the material exploded as the children were playing with it, killing six of them instantly and leaving the others with various degrees of injury. The injured was said to have been moved to a hospital in Guso, the state capital, where the seventh person reportedly died. Let's cross over to Abuja. Now here's Terry Ikumi. Terry, sad one. Well, welcome to the nation's capital. The president is challenging newly appointed ambassadors to go out and serve Nigeria with utmost dedication and pride. 
President Buhari said this during the induction of the envoys in the nation's capital, Abuja, which he joined virtually. There are 94 ambassadors, 43 of them are career ambassadors, while the remaining 51 are political ambassadors, 12 of them consuls general, and four chargés d'affaires. The president says the federal government has identified nine priority areas to guide its foreign policy, urging the ambassadors to be guided also by them. The Mohamed Buhari Conference Center at the National Intelligence Agency, Abuja, is the venue for the induction, and the newly appointed envoys are said to be inducted. I congratulate you all. President Mohamed Buhari joins the meeting virtually from the council chamber at the villa. He commends the envoys for accepting to serve their fatherland, but is quick to remind them of their responsibilities. You must strive to promote trade, human capacity development, foreign direct investment, and other areas of cooperation with countries at national and multilateral levels. On his part, the Minister of Foreign Affairs believes the foreign policy of the current administration will make the task before the diplomats an easy one. The result of the Buhari doctrine is that Nigeria is on good terms with every country in the world, no exception. So this fact alone will make your jobs as envoys of Mr. President much easier. For the diplomats, they hope to bring their experience to bear in their new assignment. I strongly believe that uh, on the issue of vaccines and other issues relating to vaccination, uh, the bilateral relationship between UK and Nigeria will be explored to ensure that Nigeria benefits from vaccination in the UK. Well, the mission is always open to having Nigerians express what they are facing as challenges, and so that's what's going to be always ongoing. The three-day induction and orientation course is expected to equip the new envoys with relevant information and skills that would enable them to carry out their responsibilities effectively. There is no doubt that they have a lot to grapple with in coming days, ranging from uh, Nigeria's bilateral relationship in the area of trade, security, and most importantly, at this critical time that the world is faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. From the Mohamed Buhari Conference Center at the National Intelligence Agency, Emperor Simon, Channel Television News. When the news at 10 returns, Nigeria's headline inflation rate climbs further to 16.5% in January as food prices hit highest level in 12 years. That's on Business News. Stay with us. Welcome back to the News at 10. The uncertainty over the leadership of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, may have settled, as President Muhammad Buhari has written the Senate seeking confirmation of Mr. Abdurashid Bawa as substantive chairman of the commission. Bawa holds a BS degree in economics and master's in international affairs and diplomacy and was one of the pioneer EFCC cadet officers in 2005. Former acting chairman of the commission, Mr. Ibrahim Magu, was suspended by the president to allow the Justice Ayo Salami-led presidential panel probe his activities. The letter was read by the president of the Senate, Ahmed Lawan. Mr. Bawa's screening will be carried out during plenary on a date yet to be fixed. Request for confirmation of appointment of chairman, Economic and Financial Crimes Commission EFCC. In accordance with paragraph 2, subsection 2 of part 1, cap E1 of EFCC Act 2004, I am pleased to present for confirmation by the Senate the appointment of Abdul Rashid Bawa as Chairman, Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. The curricular vitae of the nominee is attached here with. While I trust that the Sungri Senate will consider this request in the usual expeditious manner, Please accept the Sungri Senate President 
the assurances of my highest consideration, you are sincerely Muhammadu Buhari. To politics now, contrary to speculations that former President Goodluck Jonathan was being approached by the ruling party for possible defection, former Senate President Bukola Saraki has faulted such claims. He told journalists at the end of a meeting between the People's Democratic Party Reconciliatory Committee and the former president that the committee got the assurances of Dr. Jonathan that he will remain in the PDP and contribute his time, experience and resources to strengthen the party. Members of the Reconciliation Committee discussed with the former president how to reconcile aggrieved members of the party ahead of the 2023 general elections. The meeting, which lasted over an hour, had former governors of Gombe, Cross River and Katsina states in attendance. We are here to talk about the party. We are talk about what role we can all play in reconciliation of different parts of the party, what role people like former president like himself can play. And he left us feeling very happy that, yes, he wants to play that role in, in PDP and in uniting the party and helping us this uh, committee to move forward. And it was a very, very useful meeting, as you see, it took us so closely an hour and a half, uh, which uh, he spoke, gave us his views. Uh, we felt very happy. It uh, reassured all of us his strong commitment to the PDP and, and that um, and he's still ready to offer his time, his experience, his resources strengthen the party. That was very strong and important for us because, as you know, uh, there's a lot of um, funny stories going around, around, but we left there very, very happy with his clever come. Not only that, also ready to see our work with the Reconciliation Committee to play his own role. So that's that today we believe is a great step for the party. And we'll put that behind us all, all those of the other parties that keep on like to come and disturb our leaders. So our leaders have no, are here and we're working for this great party. Well, that's it from Abuja. Back to you, Ijoma. Thanks a lot, Terry. The president has pledged his support for massive investment in Lagos State to boost its economic potential. President Muhammadu Buhari made this remark at the opening of the Lagos State 2021 Economic Summit, which he joined virtually from Abuja. Also at the event, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wiala, asked the state government to produce an conducive environment for business inclusion and economic growth. Our correspondent, Titilayo Aberewu, reports. It's the eighth edition of the Ingbet Lagos Economic Summit. The COVID-19 pandemic has reduced the number of participants, but notwithstanding, some dignitaries are here to take part in the discussion. The co-chairman of the summit takes the stage, expressing optimism that whatever challenge the state is confronted with will be overcome. The end result so far has been seven well-received Engbeti summits, 206 resolutions, of which 193 have been successfully implemented. Please give him a round of applause. For the state governor, Babajide Sonwolu, Lagos is fast changing. The smart city that is unfolding will also be home to a network of intelligent cameras that will support not only security and policing across the state, but will also ensure that our traffic management and data connection and collection for urban planning is next to none. In 20 President Muhammadu Buhari, who joined virtually, commends the Lagos state government in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic and promises more support for Lagos in its developmental quest. The challenges of Lagos must therefore be very clearly seen as part of the challenges of Nigeria. And the federal government will support Lagos to overcome the challenges and to thrive socially and economically. Other guest speakers call for a new Nigeria that will be people oriented in order to have a secure nation. And if you focus on really delivering the basic service, services to the citizen of Lagos to enable young people to thrive, to, to, to build businesses, how can we improve the, the, the life of our citizens in Lagos? It's time to create youth-based wealth in Lagos. The past must yield to the present, the old to the new. The dominant phrase should not be, well, the young shall grow. It must be, the young have arrived. 
Not only must there be a generational shift, there must be a wealth shift by unlocking the potential of the youth. The newly appointed Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi Okunjo Iwela, also joins virtually, saying job creation should be the focus of the government to reduce criminality. When you have 60% or more of your population that is uh, 30 years uh, old and younger, then you have to worry about job creation. So for me, a successful Africa is an Africa that is able to create jobs uh, for its citizens. And when I say jobs, I mean what I would call uh, decent work. Making Lagos a 21st century is a collective exercise, and the Lagos state government is calling on all concerned to help achieve the big dream of a new Lagos. Titi Layo, Haberia Wu, Channel Television News. The National Drug Law Enforcement Agency has intercepted two suspected fake military officers in a new VIP edition of a Toyota Jeep loaded with 394 compressed parcels of illicit drugs concealed in different parts of the vehicle. According to the commander, Kogi State Command of the Anti-Drug Agency, Mr. Adeumi Alfred, the suspected fake military officers, Mohammed Noura and Abubakar Dahiru, were intercepted by operatives of the Kogi State Command of the NDLEA along Okene Lokoja Expressway on Monday, February the 15th, 2021. Mr. Alfred says when the vehicle was subjected to a thorough search, 394 compressed blocks of cannabis sativa were discovered in different compartments of the vehicle. According to him, initial investigations have revealed that the consignment was taken from Lagos and was heading to Kano for delivery. He added that the vehicle has been impounded, the illicit drug seized, and the suspects detained for further investigations. From there, let's take a look at some business news for the day. Here's Anne Waldo. Thank you, Ijoma. Let's begin business news tonight with Nigeria's headline inflation. It has continued its upward trend from last year, rising to 16.47% year on year in the month of January. And that's after closing 2020 at 15.75%. In December, latest data released by the National Bureau of Statistics today shows that on a month-on-month -month basis, the headline index increased by 1.42% in a month on the review from December's 1.61%. According to that report, food inflation climbed to 20.57%, while core inflation rose to 11.85%. At the same time, the urban inflation rate increased to 17.03% year-on-year, while rural inflation rate rose to 15.92%, coming from 15.20%. Kogi, Oyo, and Bochi states recorded the highest inflation, while Kwara, Abuja, and Cross River states had the slowest rise in inflation rate. Meanwhile, the federal government says a total of 26. 8 million extremely poor and vulnerable Nigerians across the 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory have so far been captured in the National Social Register or the National Social Investment Program. According to the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Sadi Omar Farouk, the captured number is equivalent to about 6.3 million households, while an estimate of 8 to 2.9 million, and that's about 40.2% of Nigerians living below the poverty line as of January the 31st. She also says another 20 million individuals will be added to the database and held in the Rapid Response Register which is a shock responsive intervention register, especially targeted at urban informal workers who are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Banks in the country lost 3.5 billion Naira to fraud-related incidences between July and September 2020, and that's according to Nigeria's interbank settlement system. In its latest report on the financial sector, NIBSS says the amount represents the 534% increase from 552 million Naira loss, which was reported in the third quarter of 2019. At the same time, that report indicates that the highest number of fraud incidences were detected on the online channel, which accounts for 35.5% of the total cases within a comparative period. Meanwhile, NIBSS has called for constant and proactive measures around the net and mobile phone, mobile phone channels 
of transactions, which are now considered to be viable mediums for rapid fraudulent beneficial properties. The Debt Management Office will be conducting an auction of federal government bonds on the primary market, and that will happen tomorrow, Wednesday the 17th. The instruments, which are the reopening issues, comprises of the March 2027, the March 2035, and July 2045 papers, and offered at 50 billion naira each in different rates. Meanwhile, a total of 150 billion naira is expected to be released from the bonds, which used to meet its fiscal responsibilities of the government. And let's head to the equities market. It has failed to sustain the moderate rebound recorded yesterday. Investors are still resuming profit-taking on some key equities and, of course, an increase in the volume of transactions. Ini John Mekwa has the details. Thank you so much and welcome to the Stock Market Report. The bull's dominance in the market was short-lived as the bear took over at the end of today's trading. Although more deals were transacted than yesterday, the market lost 0.19%, leaving the all share index at 40,494.35 points. Total volume of trades stood at 356.4 million units, valued at almost 5.8 billion naira. Well, much higher figures than yesterday, but Mal profit taken by investors left the market in the red. The trail of GT Bank, FBN Holding and Dangote Sugar were highest on the list of top trades and today's losses were largely due to declines from the banking and consumer goods sector. The week is still young. Let's see how the investors will continue to play in the market. I'm Ini John Mekwa. <laughs> And that's Business News for tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Umawadu. It's back to you, Juma. Thanks a lot, Anne. Police in Myanmar have slammed the country's civilian leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, with a second criminal charge as she appeared in court via video link. Suu Kyi and other democratically elected leaders have been in detention since the military staged a coup on February the 1st. Here's Simon Pusey with more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Myanmar police have filed a second charge against the ousted democratically elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Please uh, support us spiritually. Her lawyer has said in a press conference that she is facing a second charge of violating the country's national disaster law. Ms Suu Kyi has already been charged with minor offences relating to walkie-talkies allegedly imported without the proper licence and for shaking hands during the pandemic. <laughs> Demonstrators have now blocked multiple Myanmar railways by laying down on a stretch of the tracks in an effort to disrupt train services as part of a countrywide civil disobedience movement. The United Nations has warned the Myanmar military of severe consequences if it responds harshly to the protests, as reports have emerged of security forces using rubber bullets, catapults and armoured vehicles to control crowds of demonstrators. A rocket attack on a US airbase in the Kurdish region of Iraq has killed one civilian contractor and injured eight other people. A Shia militia group with alleged ties to Iran has claimed responsibility for the bombing without providing evidence, saying it has targeted American occupation in Iraq. Video footage broadcast on local television shows damaged walls and shattered glass covering an area where one mortar shell fell. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has announced plans for an independent commission to investigate the Capitol attack. We will be going forward to make sure that this never happens again. Ms Pelosi, in a letter to House Democrats, has said that a commission will be created to investigate the riots on the January the 6th. The move has come after the conclusion of the impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump that resulted in Mr Trump being acquitted. A commission of this nature would be formed by members that are not elected leaders and are outside of the government. Meanwhile, an unprecedented snowstorm has hit the southern and central United States, leaving millions of people without power amid freezing temperatures. Over 150 million people are under storm warnings as U.S. residents are navigating through heavy winds, ice and bone-chilling temperatures. 
In Texas, temperatures have plunged to minus 22 degrees Celsius compared to the usual February average of 20 degrees. Officials have been urging people to stay home as the winter storms continue to shut roads and cause traffic pileups. Guinea has launched an urgent contact tracing search after the Ebola death toll rises. Five people have now died from Ebola in Guinea as an outbreak occurred in the southeast region. It is the first resurgence of the virus in the country in five years since the 2013 to 2016 outbreak. The World Health Organization has issued a regional warning after the cases in Guinea and Congo. WHO is working closely with health authorities in both countries. The WHO's representative in Guinea has said the Ebola vaccines could arrive in the West African nation of 13 million within 72 hours. The former head of the Central African Republic Football Federation, Patrice Edouard Gaisona, has pleaded not guilty to war crimes charges at the International Criminal Court. For in Prosecutors say that Mr. Gaisona was a senior leader and national coordinator of the so-called anti-Balaka militias that coordinated attacks against the country's Muslim population in 2013 and 2014. Gaisona's participation in this strategy was integral. The former top African football executive has been charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity, including murder, rape, persecution and torture. Kenya has deployed three robots at Nairobi's main international airport in order to curb the spread of COVID-19. The robots named Jasiri, Shuja and Tumaini have been donated by Japan and will help disinfect the airport and monitor arrivals for signs of the virus. The robots are equipped with an infrared camera that scans hundreds of passengers per minute. The robots take passengers' temperatures, record their data for storage and tell those not wearing masks to put them on and those standing too close to others to respect social distancing. And finally, young patients at a children's hospital in Vienna have received a nice surprise as Superman, Batman and other superheroes have suddenly appeared in front of their windows. Vienna Special Forces police officers dressed up as superheroes and can be seen abseiling down the side of the St Anna's Hospital to surprise seriously ill children who can't receive the usual amount of visitors due to coronavirus restrictions. The superheroes have also stopped to take pictures with their young fans in the street and in front of the hospital. And that's your international news around the world in five and now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Uh, thanks a lot, Simon. On to some sports now. Here's Ayat Sunde Balogun. Many thanks to John Marine and African champions. The Super Falcons of Nigeria will begin their campaign at the fifth edition of the Turkish Women's Cup on Thursday when they face CSK Moscow Women's Football Club in Antalya. It will be head coach Randy Waldrum's first competitive game in charge of the Falcons and he is already looking forward to a good start for his team but Thursday's clash will also be the Super Falcons' first game since the team got knocked out of the race for the Tokyo Olympics by Côte d'Ivoire in 2019. In the UEFA Champions League, French League airside PSG Paris Saint-Germain stunned FC Barcelona in the round of 16's first leg match played at the Camp Nou. Barca took the lead with a goal from Lionel Messi after a penalty was awarded. However, a hat-trick from France forward Kylian Mbappe and a goal from Marcel Keane ensured victory for PSG. Liverpool put their troubles in the Premier League behind them to beat RB Leipzig at the Puskas Arena in Budapest, Hungary. Mo Salah and Sadio Mane were both on the score sheet. And that's Sports News. Is back to you, Jomo, for the round. Thanks a lot, Ayal Chunde. And the main news again. Northern governors today continued their peace mission to the southwest as they visited the scene of the communal violence in Shasha in Ibadan and joined in a forum on the farmer herders crisis in Abeokuta, Ogun State. Also today, the Speaker of the House of Representatives cautioned against inflammatory comments by leaders in the country as efforts to douse rising tension continue. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Onyato. Do have a good night.